Today's podcast is brought to you by Inverted Gear. For all your jujitsu needs, go to invertedgear.com. Save 15% off if you type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART15 with no spaces. Our next sponsor is Chimera Coffee. That's Chimera Coffee with a K. They are a coffee brand that infused their coffee with nootropics. If you don't know what nootropics are, Google it. They can do a much better job at explaining it than I can. Go to ChimeraCoffee.com, type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART for a nice little discount. Enjoy. Halle Gracie, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you coming on. How are you, brother? Man, I'm really good and really busy right now. Uh, obviously, we're a couple of days out from the show, um, but we're, we're live. <laughs> Nice, man. I, I've been looking forward to, to the next Metamorphs. I know you've had some ups and downs, but I really like how you run your event. Honestly, man, I know I know people have been giving you a little heat, but your events, they they, they run smoothly. The matchups are, are usually good, and, and I, I can't wait for this one on Sunday. And it's always a quality production. Like, it's it's top tier in my eyes. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I was just thinking about how, like, um, my sister actually told me a long time ago a quote, and she said, um, "Your enemy can't even hold a spoon right." <laughs> so, like, if you if you hate somebody, it doesn't even matter what they're doing. You're, you know what I mean? It's just like it could be the coolest shit ever. If you don't like that person, you have a problem with them personally, and you believe all the memes and you believe all the hype, and you just don't like me as a person. You probably don't like Meta Morris and it's bothering you in some way, but. If you're honest with yourself and you realize that I'm separate from the event and that the event itself is, is what jujitsu is about and is what has brought jujitsu to this level, even if you separate me from it, which you should do realistically, it's like, man, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we're really proud of, you know, it's something that people are really, people really enjoy. And a lot of people are really honest about it and a lot of people do love it. And that's why people still care and they want to see the show happen. Definitely. For sure, man. I completely agree. And that's kind of part of, like running an event and being the 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 owner, the matchmaker, everything, and people knowing who you are, right? Putting yourself in the public eye, you kind of have to take the licks, kind of like what Dana White goes through on a regular basis. Everything is magnified times ten. Yep. Now, how did this yep. event? How did this event come together? Because I know you put together the event like a month or two ago, like two months ago, and then some matchups fell through, and then I felt like. We didn't hear much about it until like two weeks ago, and that's when the card was released. Yeah, good question. So that that entire time, I've literally just been trying to nail down the biggest event possible, like the biggest main event and card and everything. And I didn't want to be the main event. (laughs) I was just in (laughs) denial. And my wife was like, dude, you just have to be the main event. And it's becoming a story, and people actually want to see this match. And I'm like, no not good enough. This is whack. I'm not going to be the main event. Yeah. Nah, and it's, just it's like so this, good. It was this battle. And now I'm like, oh, dude, like we, you know, so it just ended up being to where, you know, certain people, they were like believing a lot of the hype in the internet and they just didn't want to work with us. And I'm like, dude, all right, well, I guess I'm going to have to do this one. And then people are going to be back on the bandwagon and keep it moving, you know, and it's part of the deal. Sure. And why didn't you want to be the main event? Um, I think... I don't have the accolades, you know. I'm 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 a Gracie obviously and I think that's cool and I'm I'm prepared to go in there and go to war, but I don't have the accolades of, of a Bushesha or a Hadra or a, a lot of these guys. But it's also like having a name that brings like a lot of attention, you know? And I don't feel like I'm that big of a name. Uh, I think it has become the main event. And I had, you know, over the the course of just even a few weeks of Gary Tonin and I, like, you know, a little bit of the back and forth online, which is all like kind of real, you know what I mean? And it's all like part of, so it it has kind of become this interesting matchup. And that's where I was like, all right, I'm okay with this because the people actually do want to see this match happen. And they probably want to see this match happen more than they probably wanted to see a big main event that we were going to pay huge amounts of money for. And really, like, we shouldn't even pay huge amounts of money for a huge event. We should just pay the least amount we can and pay people that we owe and do, you know what I mean? So it kind of came together in a way where this is kind of the most honorable thing to do. And Mm -hmm. therefore, I'm, like, even more glad that I'm the main event. Now I'm like, all right, cool, I'll do it. I'm going to go in there and choke them out, go heavy. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, So it's good. And honestly, I felt that what you're saying, like, when the Bushesha-Hodger-Gracie match fell through, what was that, like two months ago? 
Was that two months ago? Uh, it could have been around a month and a half, something like that. Okay. Yeah, when that fell through, you never announced that the event was was canceled. You just kept going with the promotion, but we didn't get any hints of anything. I just, I just felt that the event was still going on. It was still being promoted. I felt that if anybody is still competing, it's Holly Gracie. And, you, you know, you were posting a lot, but you hadn't really said that you were still facing Tim Spriggs or your or the other matchups are still going on. But then, like we said, two weeks ago or, or whenever it was, I started feeling the heat like coming from Gary. And then you announced the match against Gary. And then, like you said, it just it, it naturally spawned into a good storyline. And everybody loves drama, right? That's kind of how it got pushed to the main event. But I felt that via like social media. Yes. And I, I think, I mean, your interpretation of it is accurate. You know, and I, I just... Uh, Behind the scenes, I was just focusing on getting another main event and really making the card something that would be really interesting. You know, I feel really good about the card. I, I like. I'm I'm excited about all the matches. Like, I want to see all the matches. And generally, for me, that's that's what I focus on. Is like what I really want to see. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about Kevin Casey versus Richie Martinez. I'm um, excited about Bruno Malcini and I'm, I'm every match to me yeah. and even Morgan Yeetlinger. Morgan Needlinger, uh, who's Crohn's black belt, uh, who I've been training with, and he's uh, he's going against Steven Martinez, who beat who's that kid that he caught? Um, who's the Atos kid? The guy over Atos, um, uh, Josh Hinger. He tapped um, Josh Hinger in the Metamorphs Underground in a guillotine. Oh wow! So he's no joke. Steven Martinez is no joke. So like I'm I'm just excited about that match, and man, I'm, it's good. Whole deal. Yeah, when when I saw the card released. The biggest thing that stood out to me, honestly, is Jeff Glover versus Bruno Malfasini. A, because I feel like we never see Bruno in super fights. And B, because these are just two of the most exciting grapplers, period. And the, the smaller guys need to get more love. The smaller guys need more love. And it's, <laughs> uh, it's true, man. And I'm excited about it. And I, I think especially with Jeff, like he keeps it very interesting. You know, I think like ultimately... You know, it's one thing to see two guys who are at the same level battle it out. And we've seen that in IBJJF, you know, a thousand times. Like, we'll see Bruno and whoever the other, you know what I mean? Kyle or one of, the meow, yeah. one of the meows or Kyle Terra or whatever, they're going at it. And it's like, okay, we've seen that. We know how that kind of looks. You know, we don't know how this is going to look between him and Jeff. And I think that's pretty cool. You know, and I think Jeff has that style where he comes out and he has a very free style. That's very unique and it's very interesting to watch. Win, lose, or draw. And that's you know, that's the sensationalism of jujitsu that, that we need, you know? So yeah. it's cool. Interesting take on it. And I, I wanted to know how you feel about somebody like Jeff Glover's jujitsu, how it's very free and, and kind of open ended compared to uh your style jujitsu, the Gracie style, where it's it's very much based on control and you know, not taking a whole lot of big chances. How do you feel about somebody's jujitsu like Jeff Glover? Man, I I think um well I feel like I personally identify with that more because I take more chances in all of my life and in my jujitsu that's just more and I fought I competing in MMA and that was why I've always gravitated more toward MMA so I'm a little bit more freestyle but in general his his jujitsu and his style I think is like I mean man Jeff Glover he already has gone through a prime stage where he took jujitsu to another level in his own way, you know, and he's like, he's like a legend. I don't think people really realize that, you know, he's a living legend in my opinion for jujitsu. And I think like before the internet was this huge thing, Jeff Glover was like choking people out and doing crazy shit and having amazing matches and doing and having just creating like a really cool flair with his style like he stylistically was, is like one of the most interesting people for me, you know, and when around the time I was competing as like a purple belt in jujitsu, he was killing it. He was out there just getting, you know, getting real serious with people. So that's for me, I like it. I like his whole deal. And I'm, you know, so yeah, the idea of him being involved, it's like a, it's an honor, you know, really yeah. and that for him to be against somebody like Bruno, who's a little bit lighter than him, but it's, very much training every day regularly. Whereas Jeff, I don't think he's, I think he trains, but I don't think he's really like, he's not pushing on that competitive level. Like we all know that. So 
I think that's interesting and that's reminiscent of, of my match with Gary. You know, it's a very similar kind of feel where I'm not super active competitive, but I'm at the same time I'm training and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in really good shape. So I feel good. Sure. I love your take on that, man. And Jeff Glover was, was big on the scene 10 years ago around the time Bill Cooper was big on the scene around the time Ryan Hall was big on the scene and people were fighting mm-hmm. back and forth at the grapplers quest tournaments and, and things like that. And uh, Jeff Glover just could, kind of withstood this test of time. And I feel like he went through a maturity phase where he he kind of passed the limit of like caring about what submissions he gets, what positions he gets. And now he's gotten over that hump where it's more about just getting to these surprising positions. Kind of like you get a triangle and you, you don't care for the triangle anymore. Now you're more concerned about what other things you can get there. And I feel like he's he's embraced that in competition, whereas many people don't get to that point, right? Dude, many people never have that comfort level. And I like I think like I think of Jeff and Bill Cooper as inspirations for competitive comfort. You know, like people don't even many guys, they're so nervous, they're tense, and they're just they go they stick to their like core training and they have to go in there and like they, you know, and everything is like they have to impose their very specific game or they lose their shit. You know, Jeff and Bill, like these guys were, they were famous for being like, and I think, I think they always were like that. I think you're kind of giving them credit for something that they've always been. Okay. I think it was just more, I think it just became more obvious later on. Mm. But that was that, they were doing that since day one, you know, and Jeff would do open weight matches with people and do crazy shit that you wouldn't expect and it would end up being useful in some way and he would take advantage of it and he would use very clever like that so I, and he would he was very experimental like that i have a question for you about what you're going through in a match like this like you said guys like you and i guess jeff glover who aren't training on a regular basis for like high level supreme competition uh, getting ready for you know twenty guys in your division and four matches a day, you're not getting ready for that kind of competition. But you're you've been doing jujitsu for so long, it's it's in your blood, and uh, it's it's always been a regular thing. But how does someone like yourself, who you say you're not, you haven't been training, you know, two times a day for the past how many how many years for heavy competition, defeat someone who has? What is the difference maker in that? kind of matchup well i have been training two times a day once a day you know like i've been in that mode for okay. for some time now and i was going to compete in japan new year's this last new year's i was going to fight in japan and it just kind of didn't come together the opponent whatever so but i had already been training so my real serious like training my and like kind of my development of my body and everything and like just my rhythm of training had already started like over eight months ago. Okay. So it was. It's not like I just picked up and I was like, oh yeah, out of no, like out of cold turkey, doing nothing for three months. It wasn't like that. Okay. And I, and we never really stopped doing jujitsu ever. But in our family, it's always hard to stop. And people, just my whole network of friends and people, and we just, you know, a lot of times it's just training is just part of the deal. <laughs> so, uh, but it, the main thing is is just to peak and to ramp up my training and to make sure my body feels amazing because my technique is already it's very high level you know what I mean? my technique has been tested and tried and i've gone and i've been in you know i've trained literally with people all over the world you know top level competitors i've trained with keenan cornelius i've felt different body types i've done all that and i i know where i stand and i know that in most cases I don't feel as good in those training situations because I'm not constantly competing because, and so my body doesn't really have the same like reaction yeah. time. Yeah. If that makes sense. Perfect and I sense. think that's, that's the difference. And that's where if you can develop your reaction time and you can develop your, your strength and your conditioning and be, you know, that's, I mean, that's obviously the most that we can go off of. I like, yeah. I like what you said about that. Cause it, it kind of relates to kind of what we're going through right now. Um, we're in New Jersey, and the IBJJF Summer Open is about to happen this Saturday, this weekend, in New York. And one of our students, one of our Purple Belt students, is competing. And he kind of has been going through, like, you know, casual training. And then the last the last three or four weeks, he decided he wanted to compete. And he asked for advice. And I said, listen, man, the main thing that you need to get ready is your timing and your, your just reaction time. How fast can you make the decision to go from A to B 
and how fast can you react from you know them doing something so i uh, would you agree that that's one of the most important parts when you're getting ready to peak for a tournament it's it's like nailing down that reaction time not having to think at all and just going off of you know well that that you're crossing over into into just having a good you know technical intuition which is what we've been de- like i've developed my entire life okay. so that is one thing right and then the other thing is your conditioning which is your actual physical body being a reflection of your thoughts and the level of technique that you have. So that's why it's different from your boy who's a purple belt. Mm -hmm. I don't know what level of technique he is. He may be, you know, like, and you're not going to teach him technique. You're not going to teach him very solid connections that he hasn't learned in, you know, two weeks. There's no way. So, you know, for him, it would just be a matter of making sure his conditioning is peak in the shortest amount of time possible, which is, is possible in two weeks to get very good conditioning. And it's just a matter of how you do it and making sure you don't get hurt and you, you know, you train right and you recover right and you eat right and you do everything right for two weeks and you can be very effective. But he's, um, you know, so I think that there's a little bit of a distinction there, but. Sure. And I, I didn't mean to compare you over. to a purple belt at all. I, I, I hope you didn't think I was comparing you. That's exactly how I took it. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> how do you think, your match with Gary Tonin will go down. There's no way to know, but I tell you, it's not going to go down how most people expect. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to know, though. And I, I'm, I'm not in the business of, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, a predictor. A mind reader. Yeah. I'm honestly, not a magician. Honestly, since I'm, we yeah. haven't seen much of you, I don't know what to expect. I don't know if I should expect, you know, a leg lock war. I don't know if I should expect a half guard passing war. I really don't know what to expect. And that's the exciting part. All that I know is that you're Holly Gracie and you've been training jujitsu since you were born. Yeah, man. I. But yeah, the training, the training since you're born is very overrated. I'll tell you that. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't think it just on the fact that I've had the great name and I've been around my family since birth. And I mean, there are people in my family and in my indirect family that don't train that much and don't have this, the, they don't have the technique and they don't have the fire and they don't have everything that it takes to be competitive. And that's, that's a specific type of person. Okay. I don't think everybody's like that. You know what I mean? And I think that that's okay. That's not like the end of the world. So, but there's a clear distinction now. And for me, like I'm, I actually yearn to be competitive. I don't, and that's not a joke. You know what I mean? Like, okay. I'm, I want to be competing in MMA right now. And the only reason I'm not is because my business is my focus and it needs to become a float. <clears throat> but I would rather, I want to be competing more in jujitsu. I want to be competing in MMA. I want to be competing in, IB, I, I might even want to go do an IBJJF tournament just for fun. Oh, snap. Uh, because of the challenge. Like, I just want to feel the challenge. I want to go in there and feel that environment and do four matches in a row and see what happens. But like, that's just my, my personality. You know, I'm more of a fire type. You know, and I, I, I enjoy the pressure and I enjoy the, the war. So that's me, you know, and I've been training with that mindset every time I train, you know, and I'm always thinking like I'm going to have to be ready and I'm always going to have to be sharp. And so I, I think that's a little different than like you're just in a family and you just train sometimes and you, you're supposed to train and it's cool, mm. but you have no real focus. You have mm. no intention of being competitive. And I think there's a huge distinction there. And I think knowing how to prepare your body and knowing how to condition and knowing how to eat and knowing how to do shit to, to develop yourself competitively. I already learned that competing in MMA. And I, I feel like I'm, I feel like, you know, there's competitors within Metamoris and I don't want to say names, but there's people that I know that have literally have no idea how to even like eat or how to do, how to wind down, how to not go to sleep without taking some kind of like, you know, aid of some sort. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. all this stuff where people don't even know how to like really live a warrior lifestyle. Mm. That to me is a passion. So, and that's what I do regardless of business or life or anything. That's how I live. So I'm not, you know, and that's where I'm, I feel very confident. That's where my confidence comes from. It doesn't come from like, Oh, I just happen to be doing jujitsu all my life. Therefore pay attention to me. Yeah. You know, or, or be concerned about me fighting Jerry Tonin and what's going to happen. Right. The most recent, I'm so excited uh, from your most recent Facebook and Instagram posts. 
It's showing you getting in tune with your warriorship. You're training with your cousin. Like, I'm, I'm seeing it, and it, it looks like you're calibrating everything to the same level. You're physical, you're mental. Um, it's all coming together. Has this process, is that what you're doing in this process? Well, man, I, I always do that. I just haven't ever shared myself as much through social media because I don't really believe in that. And the only reason I'm doing it now is because it's becoming a question. It's being called into question. Mm. People think that I'm like some evil person who really just wants to suck the lifeblood out of Jiu-Jitsu athletes. <laughs> there are people who believe that. So it's like, I'm because they believe that, I'm like, hmm, okay, they believe that. So now it's like I'm, I'm a little bit like I'm showing more, which I don't normally do. And I don't, you know, I don't feel like in general, you know, social media is a place to be like really personal. But at the same time, people seem to be responding to that. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like, this, I'll be more real and I'll share a little bit more of what I think sometimes. And that's cool. And it makes people more excited about the event. And, you know, like, yeah, training with Crone. And, but I was already, I've been training with Crone for years. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I just started, you know, like all that is like, it's all good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you've been doing this for a while. You've been training this, this way for a long time. It's just now you're just, just put it out people. there. Yeah. And honestly, it, now, it, it inspires now time us. To, now it's time to put it on the line, which is a very specific distinction. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where it becomes a spiritual and mental and physical culmination. And that's what I feel very comfortable with doing. And I haven't, I don't usually have the opportunity to do that. And usually, and the last time I did was fighting Sakuraba. So that's, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a science. It's not just like a, you know, it's not just like an accident. Who are your, um, who are your, your training partners that you train regularly with? Um, man, I train with Colin when he's in town. Like, he travels a lot. So I train with Colin when he's in town, which is usually like on a weekly, bi-weekly basis. He'll spend like four or five days in the gym. Okay. And then, um, and I may, you know, I may go like three days with Colin in a, in a week and then do like Kevin Casey some. I may train with like my other brother, Halen, my younger brother, or I'll train with Heat on. Or I'll train with, um, there's a couple of different guys that are like solid guys that just, I can work different positions with. I can work different techniques with. And yeah. Can we lot ask you, can we there's, ask there's you? Guys at the school, there's guys at the respective schools that are like, you know, you won't even know their names, but mm. they're there, you know, and they're, they're crucial. Can we ask you who's giving you the most trouble <laughs> on the mats? Um, man, honestly, it's different. You know, everybody has like different things that I'm, that I'm constantly like kind of learning from and, and bouncing off of. So it's, and I'm definitely not going to want to put anybody on blast <laughs> like that, but definitely, you know, it's, uh, I, I will tell you that I, you know, I've had people pushing me, you know, and I constantly feel like I'm always thinking of it as like, dude, I'm, I'm progressing. I'm learning. I'm, I'm always approaching it as a learning process and it's, it's still happening. You know, I don't feel like a black belt. Mm-hmm. So. I just feel like I'm getting started. Are you still, uh, we've talked to a lot of people on this podcast and we've always asked them about their training, how they develop. A lot of the people we've talked about have been black belts in jujitsu. And one common thing that we keep, that keeps coming up is they're not drilling as much as they used to. A lot of it's live training and, and, and positional sparring. Yeah. Positional sparring and focusing just throughout the day, just visualization on what we want to try to do. And then, and then trying to do it actually when we're rolling. Do you still drill a lot? And if you do, are there new positions you're drilling? Or are you just visualizing techniques and trying them in, in your training? Yeah, I've, um, it depends. But I can drill. Like when I go to clones, I'll do the normal class. So I'll do like the regular class and I'll do the drills that they're doing for that day. Okay. And that's for me, it's like the extent of my drilling. I'm not doing like another thousand reps of a drill of a technique, you know, but I, and I'll drill, I'll go through techniques, I'll work stuff slow and like build on it and talk about it. And then I'll just like get into training. And then during training, oftentimes like we'll stop and we'll talk about like very specific things. And a lot of stuff like at this point for me is very, uh, if there's like something where I feel like I'm not getting it or there's something that I'm something, somebody doing something to me, it usually kind of stands out, you know, and I'm, I'm really trying to, I try to stay keen on what, like what positions and what feelings I get and where I feel like I'm, I have a weakness, you know, or an exposure and usually like just different people because of their different strengths, they'll bring those out. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'll like work with them. And I'll try to like, you know, and I may drill something like literally three times 
and it's, but it just kind of gets me more comfortable with it and makes me feel like I, I'm more aware of that. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. How has training for you been different now as opposed to many years ago when you were at the earlier stages of the, the, the belt ranking system, essentially? Like coming up as a blue belt, purple belt, how was training different than it is now? Um, man, I, I feel like I pick things apart more and I'll spend more time on certain things. So like I'll I'll spend more time on a certain element if I feel like I'm I'm gravitating towards it or something I need I'll uh, yeah and that's I think the method of drilling that I I do use is I will apply a certain technique every sparring session and I'll use that as a way of drilling it to where I'm constantly using that same one and I'll roll with different belt levels like I will, I'll roll with a blue belt or a purple belt. And I'll test something on them live in real time and I'll use it. And usually I can do it easier on a blue belt, obviously, and I'll work my way up. But I'll work with a technique for like six months and feel really good about it. And then I'll switch up and do something else that I feel is more. And I, I think that's really worked for me, you know, and I just kind of keep going in that rhythm. Okay. What advice would you give somebody like me who's a brown belt moving forward to reaching the next level, which is you know, black belt eventually, and just just getting to that point where, you know, I'm reaching the next level? Um, man, I think it's it's who you're training with, and I think it's what I just said about defining weaknesses, pinpointing them, and then applying them and knowing, you know, that it's a weakness, but stepping into it, you know, and just keeping bringing it into your training and limiting your other options, like limiting your, your, your strengths in a training session. Like, even though you feel like you want to catch somebody because your ego, just say, Hey, I'm not going to do my, my signature. I'm going to, you know, do this other move over and over and over, or this one sweep or this one takedown or this one, whatever. And you kind of like limit yourself so that you can build up your, your pistons, you know, and make sure that all of them are firing equally. And that's a matter of knowing. Then you have to have real guidance and you have to know, obviously, the proper techniques. You have to have the right instructor and the right level of quality. And then you can obviously bounce it off of them and you continue to kind of develop and sharpen those those weaknesses and those techniques. But I think it's a matter of just, just lim- eliminating weaknesses. And it's and it's also, I think, starting from a defensive standpoint, mm. like really, really eliminating the ability for somebody to catch you. Mm. And, and avoiding it 10, 10 steps ahead or three steps ahead, you know, whatever, depending on the technique. Okay. That's, that's great advice, and I really appreciate that. I find myself trying to hand, handicap myself and looking for new techniques. How do I balance going from a training session where I'm handicapping myself for one particular thing to going for my A game in a role? How, how, how do I balance that? Like, do I do half the time this way and half the time that way or 100% of the time this way and 100% of the time that way? How would I balance that? I mean, I think that's on you. Uh, <laughs> I think it has to be, a, I, think, I think it has to be a feeling, you know, but I, I think uh, most of all, I just think like focusing on the basics, you know, like focusing on the basics to where you're not going to have that many techniques if you're focusing on the basics. So you're, you're really going to be able, you're only going to be able to spend, you know, like, so much time to where you know like you're going to do certain techniques that are so basic that you're just okay you're going to do that enough times you're going to feel good about it and then you're going to realize that that's actually an an empty that's actually a space that you can go so much deeper in Mm -hmm. but you're going to know that and you're going to acknowledge it but you're also going to walk away and i think it's just a matter of being aware that you're doing that and not just like just like kind of being sporadic and just doing whatever you want so I think it's about just putting it in a box and being aware, like, all right, there's that, and it's weak here, but and I'm going to do this other thing now, but I'll come back to that, mm-hmm. and I'll continue to build it. Okay. As far as jiu-jitsu as a whole, where would you say jiu-jitsu is at? Like, what, how would you describe the world of jiu-jitsu? Everybody combined, put them all into a box. How would you describe it as opposed to where it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Um, it's an interesting question, man. I think it's a... I think it's a growing sport. I think it's a growing industry, and I think it's a growing culture. And I think it's a, it's a, it has a very positive influence on so many people. And I think uh, you know it's something that at the same time it's, it's growing, but it, at the same time it's very it's actually pretty small by comparison to a lot of other like sporting industries. But that's a pretty broad question you're asking me. Mm-hmm. But I, I think you know there's 
for that, for the, for the business side of it, it's very, it's actually pretty small, but for the world kind of overall world experience and, you know, I think it's great, man. I think it's growing and I think it's exciting how much people are getting into it. And I think, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge emphasis on kind of getting to, uh, kind of coming in and, and being like, being like a, uh, you know, I, I really think like there's a, a huge emphasis on point fighting that is kind of a bubble, you know, as far as technique is concerned and as far as like effectiveness is concerned okay. for jujitsu. And I think, uh, like Hickson is trying to do a lot with his federation, which I think is good to kind of educate people on like more of the effectiveness of jujitsu. And I think that's really important, you know, so I'm interested to see how that evolves. And like, I want to get more involved with Meta Morris and with our network. I want to get more involved in that side of it and like kind of bring more of a, of a spectrum to like the quality of jujitsu and the quality of, of the, of the effectiveness of the techniques and what that means yeah. and how even like how a street fight actually is like a, is like an ecosystem for developing quality jujitsu. And it, and that can even transfer over into sport and into everything else, you know, and I think that needs to be preserved. So I, I'm a proponent of that. And obviously I'm biased and I'm a Gracie. So I'm like speaking the, I'm, I'm drinking the punch on that one, <laughs> yeah. but I, I really, in a way I don't fully drink the punch because I'm, I'm kind of doing my own thing as it is. And most people kind of figure that out by now. So I'm not, I'm very neutral in, in a lot of ways by comparison to my brothers, but I think they're, it, what they're doing as far as just kind of keeping their, you know, system the way that it is and, and continuing to pr- improve on just like focusing on street effectiveness and fusing that, I think is a huge resource. And I think it's like an, 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 a wonderful balance of, of what's going on as far as becoming popular with all the little tricks and the little stuff that's, you know, real flashy in jiu-jitsu these days. Now, what would you say to the people that are trying to separate no gi from gi as two different sports? Because People are taking the no-gi realm of jiu-jitsu and making it into this, or at least trying to make it into this completely different thing. And, you know, the movement of leg lock attacks in, in you know, grappling events have been, like, super pushed lately. What would you say to the people that are saying that no-gi is different than gi competition? Would you say it's the same or would you say it's different? Or what would you, if somebody asked you that, what would you say to them? Um, that's a good question, actually. I, I think... Uh I think, uh, hmm, that's a good one. Here's what I think. I think that the, it's true that it's two different things. And I, I think there is, and th- that it kind of comes back to my last statement about effectiveness. Like, there are athletes, it doesn't matter if it's gi or no gi, they're, they're a problem. I want to be one of those athletes. And there's a, and it, bec- and it has to do with effectiveness and it has to do with respect for the basics of, of, leverage and technique and jiu-jitsu and kinetic movement and it has nothing to do with what you're wearing and that's mm-hmm. that's the conversation about effectiveness so and i i do think from a sportive standpoint though oh yeah like wearing the gi for the most part and it, what it has become because of all of the emphasis on the technique being king and you know it's it's a huge deal if somebody gets swept it's a huge deal. Like, yeah. there's videos of people sweeping people online, and everybody goes crazy about it. All these, like, the, the jujitsu heads, like, they go crazy about it. And it's like, oh, look at that sweep. And the thing, I like it, too. I think that sweep is cool. Like, that is a clean sweep. Yeah. And Leandro Lowe, he's a technician, and his jujitsu is beautiful, and it's cool. But it's, like, it's very much its own thing, you know? And, and it has become kind of its own thing, in a way. And I think that's what people are referring to. I think they're saying... It looks like it's becoming more of its own thing because there's this really serious emphasis on playing the gi game and using the gi as a way of, of advancing and, and using the gi as a way of winning the fight. And that's where, you know, you take the gis off with these guys. Go, fight. Okay, now add punches. Go, fight. It's like, well, what is that for? Well, how, like, well that's way too aggressive. We don't need punches. Why are you saying that? Well, the reason we're saying that is why did you even get into the jujitsu in the first place? Mm. What do you even like jujitsu for? Mm. Do you like jujitsu because it's effective? Don't lie. You know what I mean? <laughs> you may think now that you like it because of the sport, but really jujitsu is only here because it was effective. And if it wasn't effective, we, none of us would be having this conversation. So true. So there's, you know, there's something there that it's like you have to acknowledge that. And at the, you know, and I think at the, it's like, it's like music and it's like any culture, you know, in music, 
the real hip hop head, they're going to talk about the, you know, the old school, the fucking, you know, like they're going to talk about that. They're not going to talk about the new, you know, sh- all the stuff on the radio. And Ugh. there's a difference. And there's like a, you know, and there was that original beat and that original style and that original, and there was something to that that created a captivating sound and it cre- and it came from records and it came from spinning. And there's like that culture that understands that and they, and they can develop and build off of that and they can make hits from that. That's cool. And, but they're not going to have all these crazy sounds and not going to have all these crazy change ups. But it's like there's a, there's a taste to it that you can acquire and you can say like later on, you'll be like, Oh, dude, that's what that was for. And that's why that's important. And really none of us would be here with hip hop if it wasn't for that, you know, and mm-hmm. I think there's something to that, you know, and you can't really fully ever escape from that. Uh, no matter what you're doing, like you can't cut your roots. So that's what I would say. It's cool. Yeah. Play your game, play with the gi, forget about no gi if you want, just know that you're losing effectiveness Mm -hmm. and you can gain a certain other type of effectiveness, but just know that you're losing another type of effectiveness Mm -hmm. and it's okay, but you're just going to, that may or may not apply to you, but maybe one day in the street, it will. You know, and I, I think there's been that conversation of like the street jujitsu guy did a berimbolo on somebody like in a fight and it was on YouTube and yeah. it was so cool. And everybody was like, oh, it worked. Look, look. <laughs> it's like we got one example. It's cool. But <laughs> I, I think for the most part, that's a scary assessment if you're going to go off that one example. Sure. Uh, but yeah. So would you say that you gain the most or you gain the most potential for effectiveness if you train with and without the key, both instead of just one or the other, like your potential, your umbrella opens up wider for effectiveness. If you train in both and you have the intent to be effective in both. Yeah. So like Chrome, he's one of the few people to tap out the Andro low. Yes. And I think that's important to note, you know, and Crone, he doesn't care what he's wearing, you know, <laughs> and, and he doesn't sit around and spend hours drilling sweet. But how is he able to cut through all that and, and submit somebody who's not, who, who spends hours and hours doing this? You know what I mean? And that's what I mean. Like, I think there's mm. something to it where it's like there, you can cut through a lot of shit if you're effective and if you have solid technique and you're not about a lot of the fluff. And I think that's true for anything, you know, and that's same with hip hop. Like you can be an artist and you can come in and you can mimic a lot of the old school style and you can probably become a sensation still you know it's just the basics there's no like there's no other you know uh you know it's just roots and it, those roots don't really they're not gone you know mm-hmm. interesting man I, I feel like i'm taking away a lot from this interview and i really appreciate that man. halleck is dropping jams <laughs> well dude you guys are actually bringing it out because you're actually you're, you're asking real intelligent questions you're not just like so <laughs> so how like, how about metamorphs <laughs> yeah what what how did you come up with the idea um, <laughs> yeah that's so good good interview Ooh, you guys geez. did it thank you man <laughs> we really appreciate it and i'm happy to hear that you're like a, a 90s hip-hop guy is that safe to assume yeah man you, I mean, the roots right that's yes. what it's all about Boom. and the roots the group like that's what i'm talking like people don't even know you know uh, like that's what the real hip-hop is exactly that's what it's all about not g and the g that's not real <laughs> <laughs> The root. I was going to ask you to uh, kick the last verse of that song, but oh well. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. No, it's funny. Like, I put myself out there as a purple belt, and it's cool. I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, but they don't know I'm still training. It's okay. Uh, you know, Marcos is really into hip hop, and he writes music all the time. He just never releases it or tells anybody about it. Yeah, I write constantly. Yeah, you gotta be you have to be careful, man. And you're as an artist, you put so much heart into it, you know, and people will just shit on it in three seconds. So yeah. you got you have to make sure you come correct. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Holly, we really appreciate you dropping science on us and we really look forward to to Metamorris. And please tell people how they can reach you, how they can order the pay per view and what time they can watch it. Oh man, just metamorphs.com and uh, I would really recommend buying the pay-per-view earlier because on the day of the event, like you're just going to be scrambling and like you're going to be, so buy it earlier, get it out of the way. You'll have access up to 10 days after the event. And if you, like people have had issues on different devices, like using the forms and stuff and filling stuff out, clearing their payment. 
So you change devices. If it's not working for you, make sure you like switch to a different device, use a, a MacBook or do something else. If you're on like a, you know, like we've had issues with different like handheld devices and stuff where people podcast, aren't able to use the forms. So change it, use your a different like, device if you have a problem. But other than that, uh, it's all good. And, you know, expect a great stream and uh, we're, you know, it goes working really hard to make sure everything works out for everybody. Please subscribe. It pushes Please, us man. further along. Thank you so much. And it allows us and to continue good luck. We, we hope to talk to you again soon. I really, really, really enjoyed this interview. Seriously. It makes a lot Awesome. Maybe when I'm in your area, we can like set up. I'll come by your school or something. You can train. Oh, hell yeah. Phone. Definitely. If I'm, uh, if I'm so in New York, I'll reach out. Subscribe. Well, uh, That's one dude, of the good luck. Can help us I know out. you're going to kill it. All right, man. Have a good day. All right, guys. Thank you. Have Take a good care. one. Peace. See you.